have time for questions. Questions and you're online, pop them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, any, as many of those questions. If you're here in the room with us, um, you can put your hand up like for real, like your actual hand, so that we know that you, you've got a question. Um, so I'll hand over to Peter. Keep in mind, Peter's going to sometimes be engaging with you online and sometimes pointing to the others here in the room. So uh, we'll hand over to Peter. Yeah, over to Peter. Great, thank you. Thank you, Jason, um, for that very warm welcome and that very um, good acknowledgement of country. I just wanted to to add to that acknowledgement of country, um, just wanting to talk about the um, special significance of the acknowledgement of country to me. Um, coming from a migrant background, I appreciate that, you know, the traditional custodians of the land have um, looked after these lands and waters for all of us, all um, new Australians to enjoy as a as a community. Um, I'd also like to thank you, Jason and, and APM and, and all of you today for this opportunity to be part of this series of um, APM's International Day of People with Disability Talks, um, especially to have um, us involved to represent some of the invisible on disabilities as well. So today we've got about, as Jason said, 20 to 25 minutes, and we'll be talking about um, the autistic experience of the world um, around them and understand the differences of that experience and the impact of this um, on, on their lives, both in the workplace and, and in general. And importantly, um, what we can do as a colleague to make our workplace um, more inclusive so that everyone in the team can do their best work. Today we'll be covering um, three, three tips, if you like, um, around the first around communication, um, the second around structure, and the third around the sensory experience. And finally, a good result at the end of the talk um, would be for us to think about how we can change our behavior. And I'd like to invite you to commit to one, one change. Uh, if you could, at the end of the talk that you feel would be simple um, to support our colleagues with invisible disabilities as we enter and recognize um, International Day for People with Disabilities in 2022. I thought a good place for us to start might be to think about um, neurodiversity. And this term is, is being used um, more frequently now. And how many of you have come across it in, in your work? Yep. Great. And it's the, the it's really used to describe a group of people whose brains are, are wired differently, if you like. And so we think about biodiversity as a huge natural variety of, of living things in our planet. Um, and neurodiversity then is just the natural variation of the human race and the different types of human brains, if if, if you like. So that might be a, a, a nice way to to look at it. And I think importantly, we want to um, think that there are multiple types of um, normal, if you like, um, and there is not just one one norm to for, for a, a brain or a way of thinking to be valid. Steve Silverman, Silverman has um, said this, that it's really thinking about it in terms of a different human operating system. And just because a PC is running Windows, um, does, sorry, just because a PC is not running Windows, I should say, um, does not mean that it's broken. So that's a nice um, way of looking at it. And I think for us in the workplace, when we think about um, different kinds of minds at work, um, different ways of working at work, 
um, and different ways of approaching our tasks at work, then perhaps we can start thinking about how by being open and flexible to that difference that we are then creating um, opportunities for inclusion of um, different ways of approaching work. Um, and in that way, then it's a, a nice universal way to approach it rather than thinking about it so much as an adjustment or accommodation. Um, it's about being flexible with different ways. We, we frame our work around a number of um, approaches and models, and one of these is a, um, a strength-based model which reflects the social model of disability, where we, we like to um, highlight the positives and the strengths of an individual um, and, and not focus on, on the deficits. And you will see that come through um, today as, as we go through this session. The other um, important approach that we would like to highlight is the importance of language. And um, our surveys at AMAZE show that the majority of um, adult or the adult autistic community um, prefer identity first language. And um, we, we do acknowledge that um, for many sectors, uh, many parts of the disability um, sector, that um, person first language is, is preferred. And so I guess what this means then is that when we are thinking about language around um, autistic people, that probably the best practice is to respect individual preference and to ask your colleagues which um, would they prefer. Would they prefer person first language or would they prefer identity first language? It's, it's also then a, a good way of thinking in terms of all the other um, aspects of difference that we would refer to the individual to find out what is their preferred style and approach. So what is um, identity first language and um, person first language? Is that something that um, you're familiar with? And because we do have the hybrid delivery, I'd like to um, just take a moment now to um, have you in the room, because I can see you, um, and some of you who are joining us remotely out sitting with someone else. Perhaps you can have a quick chat about your um, understanding of it and when you've come across these two different approaches and when perhaps you might have found it a little bit tricky perhaps to navigate sometimes. So if, you, if I could just ask you to take a minute or so to talk to the person next to you about the um, your experience with language, identity first and person first language. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, so I think what's what's interesting as well is that last line there on the slide when we think about um, person on the autism spectrum. So I'm going to talk a little bit more now about um, person on the autism spectrum. I'm sorry, before I do that, I probably should backtrack and, and talk a little bit about identity first language and why the autistic community, the majority of the adult autistic community prefer identity first language because um, it's by using identity first language, it recognizes that autism is 
is very much a part of their life experience. It's not something that can be, um, I, I suppose, it's not a state that can be changed. It is very much a lifelong um, experience for the autistic person. We also use a capital A to recognize it as a proper noun, um, to recognize it as a shared cultural experience and a shared identity. So just as you might with a with the the deaf community, or just as you might with a nationality, if we could think of it in those terms, where we have a shared identity and a shared culture. The back to what I was saying before, which was the the last line on the slide, which is the person on the autism spectrum, um, and in when we think of the spectrum, we perhaps have a we might visualize something in our mind, and um, this is how we like to think of the spectrum. Yeah. Okay. So the spectrum is I like to think about it as a little bit like a wheel. This way, um, and looking at the wheel, we. We think about the variety of traits or ways or different areas of impact on an autistic person's life um, and how the different ways that the brain processes input or processes information. Um, and so for every individual, that profile or that wheel would look different. There are some parts of the wheel where more supports required and there are some parts where less supports required. And of course, it is complex because um, it is areas of support also differ. So it's it's a fluctuating, um, and so a person's profile um, is not fixed. A couple of people are losing audio here in this, so if we can stay nice and intimate with the speaker, that would be great. Okay, I will. Thank thank you for that feedback, and um, I'll, I'll try and do that. And yep, we are going to try something different with the audio. Please bear with us. Where's the mic, Melissa? Over here. Okay, can we, can you hear me? Yes. Good, thank you. All right. The other thing I, I, th I like to highlight about thinking about that wheel is thinking about the workplace where we have different strengths and capabilities. There, there are some people that might be better in certain areas of skills um, and then others. And so we, we call that a spiky profile. And in a work environment, you, we can use this to think about different areas of um, like specialization. Just as at work, we have specialists and generalists. Um, you might find that for autistic people and for some neurodivergent people, that they have a profile that is a little bit more spiky, which means that their areas of specialization could be quite pronounced. And so in a workplace, thinking about how we might be able to, to, um, to use that as a strength-based approach when working with different types of people. The, the, other, um, the other image on the slide on the right where we can see the grey, green and blue rectangles, inputs, processing and response is a representation of how um, life might be experienced differently. And what, what we like to think about is in terms of inputs. When we think about inputs, we, we receive inputs as, as humans every day, whether it's through interaction with others or through um, our environment. And so that, that stimuli. And how these inputs then are processed is different for the autistic person 
and a neurodivergent person. So these inputs have to be processed and then after that there is a response to these inputs and all of this is different and it has a different impact um, on, on a person. So today we're going to look at what might be some of the tips and that we can do as a colleague of an autistic person to make the workplace more inclusive. We will be looking at three areas today. Um, the first is communication. The second is about structure. And then the third uh, will relate to sensory um, processing, sensory management or sensory preferences. So let's look at um, communication first. And I've started with the last point because it's going to be something I like to talk about. Um, I like to repeat that. And I think the key takeaway today, if there's only one, we run out of time. Uh, it is this one, which is to allow extra time for processing and a response. Sounds easy, but um, because of the way that we operate, it's <laughs> not necessarily something that is um, easy for us to change sometimes. And I'll talk about that later as well. So. If we know that um, the autistic experience of the world and the environment around us is, is different, then it, it's obvious that we should expect and accept um, a different communication style and different preferences when it comes to communication. A, a tip that autistic people share with us is, you know, say what you mean and mean what you say. And again, sounds simple and straightforward, but not necessarily um, easy because culturally we are used to communicating where, you know, using implied meaning um, and perhaps even using uh, metaphors perhaps or idioms, which may sometimes be a little bit harder for um, some people to understand. Another thing to think about in terms of our communication is perhaps to be flexible in perhaps um, offer multiple ways to communicate and to participate. And that might mean, um, you know, allowing a written format or a, a, a spoken format. And a good example of this is what we're doing today, where um, some of you are engaging with us by listening to me um, and also then being able online, being able to engage through written communication through the, the, the chat facility, which I think that really helps different kinds of minds and different preferences. And then finally, because we are not sure what people's preferences are like, and we're not sure how people might be receiving our communication, then to always allocate and offer um, space and time or opportunities to ask questions and to clarify details. Um, and along with that, then goes that, you know, to allocate and allow time for uh, processing the response. My experience um, in working with autistic and neurodivergent people is that um, culturally, for example, in conversations where we have conversation and turn taking, we expect responses within half a second, um, whereas Anything more than five seconds we feel is quite an awkward silence. And I'd like to um, say today that, you know, we should really feel that anything up to a minute or two is not awkward. It is just providing someone that extra time to allow processing and a considered response. Next, um, it's about letting people know what, what to expect. I think this works for all of us, really. Um, when we we know what to expect, um, we're then able to feel less anxious about what's coming up. So in the workplace, um, some of these things might be being clear and explicit in terms of what's expected in terms of responsibility and roles. And this could be a role description, but also for smaller um, contexts, such as a meeting or perhaps a, a team project where, um, you know, allow time for people to really clarify and understand what's expected in, in their roles. 
when it comes to future events, such as a meeting where we provide an agenda, how much in advance does the agenda get sent out? Is it sometimes just 10 minutes before the meeting? Um, and thinking about questions as well, so giving people time to perhaps consider what questions might be coming up so that they can formulate the response. So thinking about different scenarios, perhaps scenario A, scenario B, scenario C. So as a, a manager or a lead in a team, thinking perhaps of um, talking through some possible scenarios that might come up. And, and that's that's always good practice in, in how we might approach our work as well. So that predictability really helps reduce anxiety and um, really helps teams to work well together. And finally, looking at sensory processing, we often think about um, our senses as in the five senses, um, but really there are more than five senses. And as I was saying earlier, that the for the autistic person and some neurodivergent people, um, sensory processing of um, these inputs is experienced quite differently. And as a result, it does take a lot of energy to process that. Um, and that energy to process and to manage that sometimes can lead to overwhelm. And I think this is easy, best understood for all of us when we think about how when we are tired um, and at the end of the day, after a long work day, when we're tired, how um, noise and visual input can seem a little bit harder to, to cope with than if we were you know, um, full of energy in the morning, perhaps. Thinking then that understanding that sensory experience is, and the sensory input is different, um, is processed differently, then again, we would like to encourage you to perhaps pause and think about how we respond to difference. Again, culturally, sometimes we respond to difference with um, a autopilot response where it might be negative, but we're asking you to perhaps um, take time to take a step back and think about responding positively to, to difference. And as a result, then we might be more open to accommodating and understanding that difference and then be open to requests. So these might be in the workplace about reducing sound levels, providing um, noise reducing headphones, for example, to, um, to team members, um, being aware of exposure to smells in a, a workplace where there might be an open kitchen and microwaves in use. Lighting at the main is we have um, the opportunity to put fabric um, above, above us for to, you know, to, to to dim the fluorescent lights um, in the ceilings. And, and finally, being open and positive to stimming. You heard of stimming? Yes, OK, we have one hand up. All right, so what's stimming? So stimming is a repetitive and self-stimulatory behavior while processing inputs. Thank you for those thumbs up coming up on the, um, on the screen there. So what is it really? So how many of you put the feet there? How many of you tap your feet under the desk or perhaps um, bounce your legs under the desk? I see a few hands coming up here. Great. Um, I do it. I, I really need to do it. And how many of you enjoy perhaps um, pen flicking or twirling your pens? A few nods. Ooh, lots of, lots of thumbs coming up. Great. So that really then is stimming. So we, we all stim to some degree. But a stimming is really something that helps us feel calm and it's a coping strategy. Importantly, it helps us to focus and to um, understand content and meaning of, of what we're receiving. So for me, for example, I love doodling while, while I'm listening in meetings. And thankfully, in my workplace, it's a safe space to do that. Um, so we're, again, encouraging you in your workplace then to be to provide that safe space so that people feel that um, you know, any form of STEMI that is safe um, will be accepted. This is a um, our sensory room, a place, a quiet room where we can go to have a rest at the maze. 
um, where we've got a lot of stimming devices and um, dim lighting. And um, that brings us to um, the, the questions. I know we've had to go through this quite quickly um, and not quite practicing what I said earlier about allowing time um, for processing. And I hope um, you would understand, but we, we do have other forms of training that I promise will be done in a perhaps um, more neurodivergent field. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I'll slide back on in here. Thank you, everyone. Can we just give Peter a round of applause for the questions? I've now realized I have one of these MCI pins. I somehow acquired this and it's got a little USB in it and I'm continually sliding it in and yep. sliding it out. So I, I now I'm here. feeling I'm in a safe space at APM to, <laughs> no. to do this kind of stimming. All right, we're going to start with a question from the room here. We'll see if there's one here and then at the same time we'll look up on the chat to see what we've got there. Uh, and I uh, just want to add that, you know, it's a safe space for questions um, and you know, no judgments um, in, in terms of, of questions because we're all on this learning journey, in, including me. I, I'm not an expert and still learning. Um, I do identify as neurodivergent, um, but I do not identify as autistic and I will try my best to, um, to work with you. Um, with some of those questions. And as I said, a safe space for, for the questions with no judgment. So uh, whilst those of you online enter your questions in the chat, um, just while you're you're typing away, no doubt, um, are there any questions from here in the room? Yes. Uh, Lauren's got a question. So how can we make online meetings more inclusive then in a more virtual environment? Great, thank you, Lauren. Lauren's question, um, how do we make online meetings more inclusive? Um, this is a really good question. I think that there are, in one of our training sessions about two months ago, we had someone who identified as autistic say that um, for her, what's an inclusive meeting is she would like others to have their cameras on, but for her to have, to be allowed to have her camera off. Um, so, she 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 recognised that there was a little bit of double standards there, <laughs> um, but I think that's that's interesting. So everyone's different in an individual, but I think it's always nice to have that option where you know people ha feel that they are safe and not being judged if they prefer to have their cameras off. I think another thing that I find useful for me, for example, um, with online meetings, which I like, as opposed to face to face meetings, is that having that extra channel of that chat box where I might feel that, you know, I don't know when is the right time for me to interrupt to get my airtime to ask those questions and there's an extra channel of sending questions through the chat box. And so I think we could practice that perhaps in face-to-face -face meetings where we might allow um, people to post some of their comments and questions perhaps on post-it notes and they could just get up and walk across, across the room and perhaps just put it up on the board if they like. While, while the meeting's going on. I think that also then allows people just, you know, to get up and, and walk around, especially those of us like me, who find it really hard to sit still, which is why I, I like the role that I'm doing as a trainer, because I get to stand up like this and sit. <laughs> yeah. We did it for you. Yeah. Um, Max asks, what's the difference between neurodivergent and autistic? Great, great question. Thank you, Max. Um, I think with the term um, and neurodiversity and neurodivergent is a as like an umbrella term. And so it does talk about different kinds of um, neurotypes, if you like. Whereas um, someone who identifies as autistic, they are identifying um, specifically as, as autistic. When someone says that they are neurodivergent, it could cover um, different types of neurotypes, so they could identify as autistic, um, they could be an AD, AD, adhd um, could be dyslexic, dyscalculia, um, and there are a number of other that, um, that perhaps um, we, we could look up. And uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, Anna's asked about um, urgent situations and how how do we, oh, some words, how can high priority situations be managed with people who are neurodivergent? For example, the urgency could overload some folks. 
it's a uh, thank you for that question. Um, it was Anna. Where was it? Yes, Anna. And she's just, I've just scrolled past it. Thanks. OK, um, your question is quite general. When we think about urgent, um, I, I, I'll try and answer it and let me know if I've answered your question. I think what's important is is for us to create a safe space at work where we can have these conversations early on before a situation is urgent. So one of the ways perhaps is for to have these safe conversations where people might feel that, yes, I do sometimes get overwhelmed um, in certain situations and to be able to feel safe to inform their colleagues or their manager or their team leader about this um, before an urgent situation comes up and then talk and understand how we could manage this together, almost like like a, a plan beforehand. And I know that, um, you know, it, it does require then that cultural safety um, for that to happen. But I think, um, you know, an event like this where a workplace has started this conversation, that it's it's a great way of doing that. And so another way of um, perhaps approaching this as well is thinking about a working style statement where and rolling this out universally where people might feel that it's not just people who have asked for adjustments and accommodations, but everyone shares what their working style is, what their working preferences are, and what uh, areas that they might find challenging. And so that, I hope, helps to, to, to answer that question. Thanks again, Peter. Uh, Todd's made an observation here, he's saying with uh, many of the adaptations, I feel there's a lot of overlap with other types of neurodivergence. For example, his own experience of ADHD. Is, is that what you found before, Peter? Yeah, absolutely, Todd. And I, I think um, the, the overlap is also, you know, if we think about the concept of universal design, um, then that overlap is really for everyone. And if we, we, are, if we are able to move our workplaces and our practices and processes at work um, to be inclusive for everyone, then it will um, benefit not just the autistic and the neurodivergent, the AD, ADHDers in our workplace, but, but for everybody. Terrific. Are there any more questions either online or in the room? No? no? OK, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Um, really appreciate this opportunity that um, you've, you've given us, um, Jason and, and, and APM. Um, it's, um, it's, it's always good to have these conversations and, and to start these conversations. And I hope that I'd like to invite you to continue um, with these. And so now I want to go back to the slideshow. If I could. The slideshow. Um, and before we go, I'd like to ask you to, if you could, to commit in writing just one thing that perhaps you could do to, to change. Um, one thing that you feel would be easy for you to implement um, in your context, in your workplace, in your workspace that would, um, that would make it more autism positive or more inclusive for people with um, invisible or non-apparent disabilities. Everyone, get out your pens, make a quick note. Like the people in this room. It's like that's thing. one key takeaway. You could put it up on the board if, if, if you want. That might be a way of, of approaching it. And just while you do that, uh, just a reminder that um, we've got another session on uh, Monday with Ellie Cole, um, who will be the uh, wonderful Paralympian, who will be talking to us about uh, what we can do to. Uh, make workplaces more inclusive for para-athletes, either former or current. Uh, and then Thursday next week, we've got Ben Johnston, who has a vision impairment, who's going to be talking to us about how we can uh, include, be more inclusive for people with vision impairment in the, the workplace. So make sure you register for those sessions if you haven't already. I have. You have, yeah. Yes. Good, 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 good. Yes. Great. So is there anything else you wanted people to do with that, uh, that, that commitment that they've made, Peter? I think it's 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 a good way to share that with and you know have an opportunity to talk to your teams about that. So just to keep that conversation going, it's it's a good start.
and this one or similar is that? Oh, that's just um, our contact details. There we go. Yep, ha happy for um, you know for us to continue this conversation um, through these contact details, um, or you can also find me on LinkedIn. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, let's thank Peter one more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all again for uh, joining us this afternoon for this second of four presentations. Take care. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.